pere, 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 Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Crap Cafe. Now, I know I'm known as more of the guy who makes delicious theories on lesser known and forgotten characters, but from time to time, I do have to step into the weekly chapter ring to remind everyone exactly why I'm allowed to cook. So for today's video, I'd like to address the most recent chapter, 1130, and the reveal of a very interesting new character. And with his introduction to the series, Oda made sure to leave us with a juicy question to ponder throughout this extended break. And while there's a lot of different ideas being thrown around, I think I may have already solved Oda Sensei's puzzle and uncovered the identity of Loki's devil fruit. So make sure to watch through the end of the video, as in doing so, I've also got a solid idea of where Oda might plan to take this character going forward. And to top it all off, we also have a few updates on a recent theory of mine, as Loki's introduction also included some new information regarding some additional consequences to Dory and Bragi's 100-year absence from Elbath that ties in perfectly to my previous theory. So buckle up and let's begin by reviewing the events of this most recent chapter. First off, we have some huge news, as after the reappearance of the giant warrior duo on Egghead, the world government has officially updated their bounties, increasing them all the way from 100 million to a whopping 1.8 billion each, bringing the giant warrior duo up to a combined total of 3.6 billion berries. This also seems like less of a retcon from Oda, and more of an adjustment to include the rate of inflation in the One Piece world, as Robin so graciously pointed out. So despite their performance on Little Garden at the start of the series, this is proof that the strength of these two giants should not be overlooked. Additionally, we also learned about the true identity of Harudin, the 6th Division commander of the Straw Hat crew, who is apparently the Prince of Elbath. Or should I say a Prince of Elbath, as it has just been revealed that he and Loki are brothers, with Loki being the younger sibling. But according to the giants, unlike his older brother Harudin, who has dedicated his life to upholding the giant's legacy and proven himself to be the pride of their nation, Loki has devoted himself to darkness and has since been sentenced to crucifixion, a feat that apparently took the entirety of the warriors of Elbath to pull off. And now, Loki sits chained at the foot of the giant Yggdrasil tree, where he's seemingly been sitting in wait until the day he can eventually break free from his bonds and, as he puts it, bring about the end of the world. But now that he's met Luffy, what on earth is going to happen? Is there a chance that Luffy will choose to free this monster and possibly invite him on board the crew? Well, in order to know for sure, we'll need to dive into Loki as a character and see what we can unearth. And I believe that once we know a bit more about his history and special devil fruit, we'll be able to fully predict Oda's direction for the character going forward. <laughs> While Harudin seems to be the pride of Elbath, his brother Loki has become known as its shame, and I think it's pretty clear as to why. Not only is he accused of killing his father, the king, in order to acquire his family's legendary devil fruit, but even going back as far as his birth, he's been known as the accursed prince, which is actually a little strange, as why would a newborn baby already be considered accursed? Well, thanks to the research I did for my Dory and Bragi video, the reasoning behind this is rather clear to me. You see, if we look back to one of the main ramifications of Dory and Bragi's absence, the birth of Big Mom, you may understand the first aspect as to why Loki is the accursed prince. Because Charlotte Linlin was still in Elbath at the time of Loki's birth. In fact, the fast that caused Big Mom to have her first major hunger pain incident and led to the destruction of an entire giant village and the death of one of the village elders was actually supposed to be in celebration of Loki's birth. So it's more than likely that the superstitious giants took this catastrophic event occurring just after the birth of the new prince as a bad omen. But nothing would have prepared them for what came next when the newborn prince began to sprout horns. That's right, if you hadn't noticed, Loki is sporting a nifty set of horns, and I don't believe that these are just a part of his helmet or even an aspect of his legendary devil fruit. But while we don't fully understand the relationship between the Oni and the giants, 
I don't think it's too hard to imagine that due to his differences, Loki may have been discriminated against by those around him throughout most of his life, which would actually add yet another ramification of Dory and Bragi's 100-year absence. And while Oda is attempting to build up Loki as some sort of antagonist for the arc, by alluding to the idea that he murdered his own father to gain access to his powerful fruit, I'm predicting that Loki's past may be a bit more complicated than it seems. And I think there's a good chance that he may just become our 10th official Straw Hat. Not only is he one of the first new characters we've met in the arc, which is usually a sign of a larger storyline to come, but when you combine the lifetime of discrimination he probably faced with the few details we've learned about his past with Big Mom and Lola, as well as his current position in the story, I think we can see the beginnings of yet another tragic Straw Hat backstory. And, like many of the other Straw Hats, he has already presented his dream to Luffy. It's just that, unfortunately, it's not as family-friendly as the rest of the group. And, for whatever reason, Loki wants to bring about the end of the world. And with the amount of aura he's giving off right now, I think there's a chance that he just might do it. Especially if this legendary devil fruit he ate is all it's cracked up to be. So, just what is Loki's fruit? Well, to be honest with you, I think Oda may have already given us everything we needed to know in the background details of this chapter. And you'll see that once we fit all of the pieces of information together, all of the evidence points towards a single direction. Before we go blindly speculating on the nature of Loki's fruit, I think there's a few things we can all agree on right away that will narrow our search down considerably. So first off, I think we can all agree that this fruit, known for being the treasure of the royal family of Elbath, probably holds some sort of ties to Norse myths and mythologies. And given the legendary status of the fruit, it probably has an association with one of the major deities in the mythos. And when considering that Loki shares a name with one of the main gods in their pantheon, there's a high likelihood that the fruit will pertain to Loki himself, or another god closely associated with him. So it could be another mythical zone god fruit, or fruit with an ability that mimics the powers of a Norse god, like a lightning-based fruit to mimic Thor, or a reality-warping power to be more akin to Loki. So now that we've established a starting point from just a few contextual clues, let's start by analyzing the actual narrative clues surrounding Loki's introduction so far. We first encounter Loki after Luffy leaps into the giant wolf-infested woods. In order to investigate Loki's powerful presence and the roars that keep shaking the colossal island. And it's there that we find Loki bound in chains and blindfolded. And this is where we learn his ultimate goal in life. When he claims that he is the sun god who will bring about the end of the world. So with his claims of being the sun god, it is possible for him to be the sun god of Norse mythology, Sol. But I don't necessarily think this is the direction that Oda is taking things, as Oda usually incorporates every facet of a character in with their abilities. And outside of his claim, there's nothing that really links him to Sol. But I think that there's another possible Norse god, and thus devil fruit, that connects every clue we were given in the chapter, and perfectly fits with the direction that the series is headed. So let's take a moment to recap all of the evidence we've acquired to see if you can guess where I'm headed with this theory. First, we should assume that this fruit is a mythical zone god fruit of some sort, given how sacred it is to the giants and its legendary status. From there, we can assume that it will be a god associated with the Norse god Loki. Plus, we also have the information regarding Loki's dreams and his current position in the story. As after acquiring his fruit, Loki was so dangerous that it required all of the warriors in the country in order to restrain him and imprison him in the lowest level of Warland. And that's where he's been waiting ever since, hoping that he can eventually find a way to break free of his chains so that he may finally bring about an end to this world. But depending on how familiar you are with Norse mythology, there is a god who fits these terms perfectly. A child of Loki, born in the land of the giants, that grew so large and powerful that the gods of the Norse pantheon had to come together to capture and imprison him. And according to the myth, he is to remain chained until Ragnarok, the battle at the end of the world, where they will eventually break free and go on a rampage, devouring the sun and killing Odin, the father of the Norse pantheon. That's right, I believe that Loki has eaten the mythical Inu Inu no Mi, model Fenrir, the great wolf destined to bring forth the end of the world, Ragnarok. 
I believe that the Frenmere fruit is truly the only choice that connects all the clues and insights Oda gave us during this chapter. This perfectly explains all the roars that Luffy has been hearing and possibly even explains the concentration of giant wolves in the area. If Loki has the Inu Inu no Mi, he should theoretically be able to communicate with the wolves. And with him being blindfolded, he could possibly be using them as an information gathering network. Or even simply just to keep pests from bothering him while he's imprisoned. It also seems fitting for his design, with his shaggy hair and long tongue. But the real linchpin here revolves around the legendary battle of Ragnarok and Loki's ambition to end the world. You see, Fenrir is often credited as the Hound of Ragnarok, and him breaking free of his bonds and devouring the sun is the precursor to the event in every version of the myth. So Loki mentioning the sun in any capacity while referencing the end of the world is enough for me to be all in with this theory. So what are Fenrir's abilities, and what will Loki be able to do with the Fenrir fruit? Well, in the Norse myths, Fenrir is a child of Loki and a giantess called the mother of all monsters. But as he aged and developed, his size continued to grow and grow until Fenrir was the size of a mountain. But because Fenrir was already prophesized from birth to bring harm to Odin and the gods, he decided that before Fenrir ever had a chance to turn on them, it was necessary to find a way to stop him while they still could. So the gods got to work, and after forging an indestructible rope out of a series of impossible objects, such as the footsteps of a cat, the breath of a fish, and the roots of a mountain, they were able to trick Fenrir into imprisoning himself. And it's told that as he snapped his jaws at the gods who wronged him, they grabbed a great sword and plunged it into his throat, gagging the wolf. And so much saliva ran from Fenrir's mouth that it formed the Norse River Vaughn. And it's there that Fenrir was to sit and wait until the end of time. And the day he breaks free will be the beginning of his retribution on the gods who imprisoned him. So as far as to what abilities Loki will gain from the fruit, I think it's clear that the main power will be to transform into the Goliath Wolf. And when combined with Loki's already giant size, his full Fenrir form could be as much as 10 times the size of the wolves we've seen surrounding him in the forest. But I also think that Oda is going to incorporate Fenrir's ability to constantly grow in size. So it's possible that like San Juan Wolf, Loki will be another size-shifting giant. And this last possibility is more of a long shot, but I think it would be dope to see it happen. In the last panel of the chapter, when it pans out to show the entirety of Warland, there is a monolithic sword plunged into the island. Now, there are few things in the One Piece world that even come close to its size, but given the possible size of Loki's Fenrir transformation, I think that there is one character who could possibly wield it, and it would be incredibly fitting. As in the myth, Fenrir was imprisoned with the sword left wedged in his mouth. But what if, after breaking free of his chains, Loki inverts the narrative and instead takes up the massive sword and wields it in his mouth, Sif style, against the gods? Oda has already missed his opportunity to make use of the massive sword shown in Wano. So now that there's another here in Elbaf, I really hope that Oda doesn't leave yet another Chekhov's gun lying in wait this time around. But now that we've identified his fruit, let's see if we can go one step further and predict the direction Oda is planning to take this character. I mentioned at the start of the video that I'm anticipating that Loki will become the next official member of the Straw Hat crew. He already has the drip, the dreams, and a drizzle of a sad backstory in the making. But if Loki plans on doing what he says and bringing forth the end of the world, then by using narrative clues, it will probably be a Ragnarok-like event. And I think we already know exactly what this One Piece Ragnarok will be. Whitebeard actually used his dying words to promise a war that would turn the world upside down. And when would this war occur? Once someone found the One Piece and discovered the complete history of the Void Century in Ancient Kingdom. And despite all the tough competition still remaining in the final saga, I don't have a single doubt that Luffy, the true Sun God, will be the one to find that great treasure. So this leads me to believe that if Loki is looking to live up to his self-proclaimed destiny, he'll have to accompany Luffy to Raftal, discover the One Piece, and then he can begin Ragnarok and turn the world upside down.